Hello everyone. Hello everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar, Enabling the Fourth Network Revolution with the Self-Driving Network and Intelligent Operations, sponsored by Juniper Networks with participation from Accenture. Before we begin, I wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. On the right-hand side of your screen is the Q&A. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can type your question into the Q&A box and submit your questions to our speakers. All questions will be saved. So if we don't get to answer you, we may follow up via email. At the bottom of your audience console are multiple application widgets you can use. If you're having technical difficulties, please click on the yellow help widget. Here you can find answers to common questions. A copy of today's slide deck is available for download in the green resources widget. Towards the end of today's presentation, we'll ask for your feedback. Our survey will pop up in on your screen and will only take one minute to complete. Your feedback is extremely helpful. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available about one day of the event and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier today. I would now like to turn the event over to Heavy Reading Senior Analyst James Crosha. James? Thanks, Caitlin. Hello and welcome, everybody, to this light reading webinar about enabling the fourth network revolution with this self-driving network and intelligent operation sponsored by Juniper Networks. As Caitlin said, my name is James Crawshaw and I'm an analyst with Heavy Reading. I'm joined today by Aurelio Nosserino, who is Programmable Network Platform's lead for Accenture, and Kiriti Compella, who is CTO Engineering with Juniper. So in terms of today's agenda, I'll give a brief introduction and then I'll hand over to Kiriti, who will talk about the fourth network revolution concept. He'll talk about the current status of self-driving networks and also about the longer term impact of this move to the self-driving network. He'll be followed by Aurelio, who will talk about the intelligent operations concept. I'll wrap up with some brief conclusions and hopefully we'll have 15 minutes left at the end for audience Q&A. So please submit your questions as we go through today's webinar via the widgets at the bottom of your screen. So there are three main reasons that are driving operators to autonomous networks. The first is about economics. Networks are essential. In today's interconnected world, we simply can't live without them, whether it's a consumer or an enterprise. But they're expensive. It's not just the equipment. The big expense is the resources required to implement networks, run them, and make sure that they meet all those changing needs of enterprise customers. Automation and autonomy can help to reduce costs. So that brings us to the second point, agility. The enterprise, whether it's um, a small, medium enterprise, a service provider, perhaps a government, they all run on applications. And if you are the IT or networking department, you not only have to keep the applications that you have running, but you're constantly being asked to add new applications with more functionality, more flexibility, more capacity, more of everything. So how does every single user of those applications access them? Well, it's via the network. But the network today is still too manual. It simply takes too much time to configure and reconfigure on a device by device basis. And that brings us to the third aspect, security. The network is also the common point of every threat. Hackers use the network to get in, get around, and get the information that they want out. And threats today, don't just number in the millions, they are literally hundreds of millions of new threats every year, far too many for us to keep up with manually. But with automated systems, no matter where a threat appears, we can identify it, we can isolate it, and we can stop it without the need for human intervention. So those are the drivers behind this move to self-driving networks. Let's start with an audience question poll. What do you think is the top use case for artificial intelligence and machine learning, which are some of the key enablers for autonomy and networking? What do you think are the top use cases for AI and ML in networking? Would you say it's anomaly detection for security? Would you say it's trouble ticket action recommendations, proactive service creation, prediction of network faults, or 
do you think the biggest aspect or the biggest potential is in network capacity planning, perhaps doing predict predictions about future points of congestion? Pick one of those uh, responses as uh, your favorite option where you see the, the biggest bang for the buck with the AI in networking. And whilst you have a think about your answer to that question, just remind everybody to submit your own questions to Aurelio and Kiriti, which we'll get round to answering in the last 15 minutes or so of today's webinar. Okay, let's see what the uh, audience has voted for. Um, so we've got a broad spread of results, uh, but the most popular one is prediction of network faults. Um, second most popular one is another kind of prediction, network capacity planning related to prediction. Um, and uh, contrary to my expectations, security actually didn't do that well. Only 13% or so uh, said um, security was the, the top application. I'll do a quick refresh. That hasn't changed much. That, that surprises me a little bit, uh, Carisi. Um, do you, would you also find when you're talking to service provider customers that security is a top concern or, or sorry, a top um, use case for AI? Uh, or uh, are you hearing a lot of interest in uh, prediction of faults and congestion? I hear a lot of uh, prediction of faults, but I, yes, I am a little surprised too. I think security should be uh, higher up there. Um, maybe people are looking at what, um, as you said, networks are growing very fast and how do I plan for that? Uh, and that's why this is picked up. But once we get that under control, I believe security will come back to being a top uh, concern because security is always you know, at the back of people's minds. Sure. Okay. Well, with that, Kirisi, why don't we go on to the next section of the presentation where you're going to talk about this fourth network revolution concept. Thank you, James. Um, yes, I'm Kirisi Kompela. Uh, I work at Juniper Networks. And I want to talk to you about the fourth uh, network revolution. And to put that in context, um, I want to talk about um, this guy, Klaus Schwab, who was uh, a an, an German engineer and economist and came up with this framework for thinking about the industrial revolutions. Um, so he considered the first industrial revolution using water and steam power. The second one used electric power to create mass production. The third used electronics and information technology to automate production. And in his view, the fourth industrial revolution is building on the third. Uh, it's the digital revolution characterized by a fusion of physical, digital, and biological technologies. So we want to use that framework to look at um, what's happening in networks. And in networks, you have, you know, back in the day, you had the telephone as a means of point-to-point -point personal communication, and then there was the rise of the, of basically of IP, WAN, and packet transport, where we switched from circuit switched communication to packet switch communication, but primarily for academics, researchers, military. The network 3.0, the third revolution, was about protocols that scale to much, much larger um, networks. You had the global internet, and then you had all these consumers getting on the internet, and then, of course, uh, ending in cloudification. And what we see as Network 4.0 is the use of advanced algorithms, machine learning, and AI in making networks much more usable, uh, much more, uh, much safer, and much more capable of understanding what we want from them. So um, what does this uh, fourth uh, network generation consist of? Well, we look at uh, a, a big driver for that being the self-driving networks. And for that, we have these five foundational technologies. And a common question that I, I get asked, because I talk about this a lot, is, is it going to take 10 years to get there? So what I'm going to present to you here is the, the current the technologies as well as the current state of the technology. So the first one I want to talk about is automation, and this is something that Juniper has been working on for a very long time. We've had automation um, in our, uh, in our uh, software for a very long time uh, on our routers, on our switches, on our uh, firewalls. 
And um, the current state of this is what we call the Junos Extension Toolkit, but there are frameworks that allow you to use Chef and Puppet, if that's what you like, or SaltStack or Ansible. The next one is telemetry, and telemetry is something that you really need because um, the, the new technologies of data science and machine learning feed on data, and telemetry is the raw data that goes into that. And so we've completely changed the way we do telemetry from doing a poll-based SNMP style, asking the box every so often what's going on, to this data coming out to you. And, and this is now real-time streaming at a very high granularity. So, so we think that this is a very foundational piece the next one is intent-based networking, and this is where you have to, uh, it's instead of getting deep into the network and typing away at the CLI, you tell the network what your intent is. How do you want customers to be treated? How do you want congestion to be handled? What do you want to do when there's uh, out of capacity in some part of the network? You basically give your high-level intent, and then um, uh, it it takes effect. And to do this, we are coming up with a series of Juniper bots. You, in the previous bullet, you saw the health bot, which monitors the health of a device. But we have bots that do peering, that do BNG, and other network functions. The next one is multidimensional views, where you look at the network uh, telemetry from multiple points of view, across time, across geographies, across layers of the network. And you look at how different peers of yours are, are interacting with you, how different clouds um, in terms of maybe the latencies for uh, reaching them. And so you have a much better view of what's going on. And if, if, uh, if the need warrants it, you can zoom in to a particular thing and say, tell me in more detail what's happening with that flow. And if that's uh, benign, then you can zoom back out. But all of this is predicated on making good decisions and having those decisions made by a machine. And so for that, that is the, the technology that we have been working on the, the most recently. So the Juniper Extension Toolkit is many, many, many years old. Um, so all these other technologies are 5 or 10 or even 15 years old. The decision-making is relatively new. So let's look at that. So uh, about a year and a half, two years ago, we bought a company called AppFormix, and AppFormix brings a lot of uh, data science and machine learning, but we also built on other uh, technologies that we had in-house, and then about seven or eight months ago, we bought another company called Cyford. All of these are increasing what we can do with machine learning. So. Uh, internal projects to improve machine learning, as well as um, this, these acquisitions that bring in talent. And so basically, we want to use the telemetry that we get, the data ingest, uh, and use it to improve automation, uh, use it to learn what's going on in the network, whether it's by unsupervised learning or supervised learning, and then use this real-time uh, analytics to be able to do something in the network, uh, make some changes, or alert the network operator to doing things. So we see that this decision making is really important, both from the point of view of um, making decisions as well as um, to the questions that we saw, making predictions about, you know, where would I have congestion, or where should I add capacity in my network, or um, what can I expect in terms of uh, people attacking my network? So this is fundamental in, in, uh, in this notion of self-driving networks. So why would we go down this path? Um, what are we trying to achieve with all of this? Well, there are three basic uh, targets for this self-driving network that, that we think would benefit from the self-driving network. One is the customers themselves. At the end of the day, the network is pro providing a service to these customers. And in many cases, the customers, uh, they're dissatisfied um, to the extent that they can, especially for mobile customers. They churn, they, they switch from one uh, provider to a different one saying, this, guy's, this, this uh, company is not doing 
not giving me the service that I need. Uh, and so if you can actually use these techniques, uh, use prediction, use machine learning, use the self-driving concept to anticipate their demand, to real-time adjust uh, network resources so that they are getting the best uh, uh, service, the best connectivity. If you can say under the covers the network is so much more reliable, so you won't see outages, you won't see these blips. Um, and especially if you can say you will be in a much more secure environment, you will have much better personal privacy. These are all things that will make customers happier with their network and less likely to churn and to change uh, providers every few months. So that's the first target. The second target is network operations itself. Um, a lot of network uh, work is mundane and uh, you know, you're doing the same thing over and over, and when you do the same thing over and over, uh, mistakes creep in, or you, you think you're on one box, but you're on a different box, and then you have applied the wrong policy or the wrong firewall uh, in the wrong place. So, and, and a lot of people are just catching up on what, they're, what they need to do, and they don't have time to, to do what they want to do. This is the, the, the old story of the urgent taking over from the important. So there are important things to do, but the urgent always you know, usurps your time. So with uh, the self-driving network. What do you want? This is the, the, the old story of the urgent taking over from the important. So there are important things. Um, so, sorry. Um, so you have AI and uh, humans w working jointly and able to uh, handle this, this, all this mundane work. Um, but of course, in the process, there's an opportunity to upscale. So my BGP skills are still needed, but I also need to know how automation works, how, um, how the machine uh, learning works so that I can uh, tweak it to do the right things. And in, at the end of the day, maybe we can get to a place where we can do proactive service creation. And if that happens, then, then the, again, this goes back to the customer saying, hey, you know, I wanted that, and I, it's here. I didn't even have to ask for it. So, so I think we can uh, not only make the network operations people uh, much happier in their work, much more able to do what they need to do, but we can also make the customers uh, see that things are working better. And the last uh, category is the network providers. So it's not only the service providers. It could be a network provider at an enterprise. It could be a network provider at a financial institution. Uh, and for them, um, they're looking at the network um, as a, a cost point where essentially um, I have to put all this effort in, I have to put all these resources in, I have to buy all this equipment, I have to run it. Uh, what do I get for that? Uh, and then people say, oh, all, all I get is security breaches because it's through your network that people are stealing my credit card numbers and so on. So there is um, the, the concern of how do I get to a higher level of security? How do I, all this money, all this capital I'm putting into the network, how do I know that I'm using it to the best of my capability? How can I be more... Uh, how, how can I have better business predictability so I know in a month I'll need some resources here, in three months I'll need something there, but this other place is fine and I don't need to do anything for maybe six months. Again, at the bottom of all this is how do I make my customers happy? So what you get from that um, um, you know, is a whole set of um, making, um, just to go back for a second, um, if you do the first part and your customers are happy, the CEO of the company that's running the network is happy because at the end of the day, that's what they want. If you make the network operations people more efficient and happier at their work and take out all the mundane stuff, the COO of the company is happy. And, of course, if you make the service, uh, the, the use of the network resources much more efficient, then the CFO is happy because he knows that the money he's put into the network is being efficiently used. So, so you really are looking at um, doing the self-driving network to make sure that the company executives 
are happy in the way this whole thing is going. But there are the other sides of this, which is the socioeconomic impact, which is um, when you start bringing AI into all of this, what does it mean? When you start changing the way you run the network, what does it mean? And so there is the whole question of how do I design networking in the future with the impact in mind? How do I promote universal access? So if it's much easier to operate a network, I can bring networks to many more places than I could today because I just look at the cost of deploying it and I say no, but if it, the cost is significantly lower, I can take it to many more places. Um, I do really want to enhance uh, user experience and protect their privacy, but that also means um, knowing more about the users, so I have to use that data very carefully and make sure that I'm not uh, misusing it. Um, as I said, um, there's a whole uh, set of uh, new skills that we need to do to train our network operations people on. So they still need to know BGP, they still need to know ACLs, they still need to know um, Junos, the operating system, but they also need to know how automation works, how um, machine learning works. Um, secure against cyber threats because the people who are attacking the networks and attacking content are using the latest technologies. We can't defend that by having humans try to stop that. But at the bottom of it, in embodying the principles of ethical, transparent, and accountable AI. And this is something that we often forget. As technologists, we just say, what's the next best thing that we can do? Um, so I think we should be very... Uh, aware of these issues, and as people who develop the technology and deploy the technology, and maybe even as people who are receiving the benefits of this technology, we should still keep these principles in mind. So what does the journey uh, to a self-driving network look like? Well, we start with human-driven automation, where I take a task that is mundane and rep repetitive, and I write a script, and now I can push a button, and instead of one router being upgraded, 50 routers get upgraded. From that, I move to event-driven automation, where when a certain event occurs, when a certain uh, incident occurs, I have already in place a response for that. Now, of course, there could be a human behind that to make sure that the response was accurate, but um, there is no lag where an event occurred and a human had to be called and then, and then the action had to be taken. So that's a huge uh, improvement. Then you have machine-driven automation where the machine looks for things and says, oh, uh, I can see such and such is going on, so I'm going to do certain things on my own. But it's a man-machine interaction. Um, there are sophisticated algorithms, but at the same time, humans have to make decisions where the machines cannot. And then you reach full autonomy, where um, we've taken care of all the corner cases, we have all the events, uh, all the um, potential uh, occurrences already set up, so um, the machine can just run the network, and the human's only responsible for monitoring and making sure that everything is going well. So, so there you are. This is not something that is you know, 10 years away. Um, bits and pieces of this are being delivered as we speak, and I think we'll get to a very good stage of machine-driven automation in the next three or four years, and full autonomy may take longer, but, but we're not far away. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Kirichi. That brings us to our... Oh, there are the results. Sorry. That brings us to our second audience question poll for the day. Um, at what stage is your organization in the adoption of AI in networking? Would you say you're still um, at a sort of wait and see stage? Um, have you perhaps started some proof of concepts for AI in networking? Are you already working with some suppliers who are incorporating AI into their products? Or have you already built some internal expertise in AI and um, that's already um, playing a part in your future products and service roadmaps? 
So pick one of those responses which you think best characterizes your organization. And whilst you're thinking about that, just remind everybody to submit your own questions to Kariti and Aurelio, which they'll get around to answering in the last 15 minutes or so of today's webinar. OK, hopefully we've got enough responses now. So I'll, I'll push out the results, see what people have voted for. Um, so there are three options which are broadly similar in popularity, the wait and see approach, the oh, we've done some proof of concept, and then leaping ahead, those who've already built an internal AI expertise. Um, surprisingly, few went for the, the third option where you're, you're working with suppliers. Um, let me just do a quick refresh and see if we've got, nope, that hasn't changed much. So the suppliers are letting people down, Kiriti. That's a bit embarrassing. Um, they seem to be okay at developing expertise internally. Uh, those that um, that are plowing ahead with uh, with AI, um, and um, but um, suppliers coming up short. Um, Aureli, I guess, as a non-networking equipment supplier, perhaps you can you can offer some a slightly uh, independent view here. Do you? Uh, do you think the network equipment manufacturers are, are coming up short here and, and hence you're, you're sort of filling the gap as a um, consulting provider in, in terms of AI expertise and know-how? How would you interpret these results? Yeah, I, thank you, James. I see that these results are uh, very much aligned with what we see on the market uh, today where typically in the intelligent operation journey, automation is the first step that uh, most of the operator are taking and uh, the AI is something that uh, or they are still understanding uh, how to leverage or are more in a proof of concept or limited uh, um, trials given also the impacts on the processes, internal processes and skills that the full adoption of AI may impose. So very much aligned with uh, with what we see on uh, on the market or for the, these results. Okay, interesting. Well, with that, Aurelio, let's pass the baton over to you and talk about intelligent network operations. Yeah. Thank you very much, James. And thank you very much also, Cariti, for the great and clear explanation about self-driving uh, network. Uh, my name is uh, Aurelio Nocerino from Accenture. And now I will switch from the self-driving network to the operation uh, side. Uh, we know that digital disruption is uh, providing uh, to com uh, communication service provider the opportunity to completely redesign their customer experience strategy and then run digital transformation program in order to implement such strategy, also to remain competitive and relevant on the market uh, today. Interesting enough, according to a recent Accenture survey, half of the executives that we interviewed feels that one of their main bottleneck for such transformation program is their back office. Uh, basically, what they perceive is that the back office, uh, including the operation, uh, simply is not keeping pace with the requirements that came from the digital transformation and mainly from the front office uh, transformation program that they are running through. Uh, the implication of such transformation for the network cooperation organization are massive, uh, as we may imagine. Uh, they need to make fundamental changes and transform their way of work, uh, becoming uh, the intelligent engine, as also Kariti was a little bit explaining before. And uh, in order to get there, they need to uh, acquire the level of agility and flexibility needed to keep up the pace of these requirements. In order to reach this goal, they need to they have a challenging task of harness the talent, the data, and the automation, and also the intelligence in order to transform process, skills, tools, and infuse the agility that is, uh, that is required. Uh, the holy grail of this uh, transformation, as uh, we see in our experience, is uh, uh, at the uh, intersection of the analytics the automation and the artificial intelligence itself, three key ingredients to consider. Uh, each of these ingredients taken in isolation has its own distinctive value. So the automation that drives the efficiency as the early trial and also large-scale deployment are proving, 
Uh, as it happens, for instance, as we see in uh, automating task, in, uh, for instance, uh, to orderly restart of set of chained virtual function application as a consequence of a fault, or uh, even more advanced automation uh, to uh, managing uh, all processes like network uh, uh, incident, uh, leveraging, uh, again, existing processes and tools. Uh, the analytics or the smart analytics itself, uh, uh, they improve the decision-making uh, process. And today, as we speak, they are fundamental to support, for instance, uh, real-time uh, troubleshooting. By collecting and correlating uh, real-time data, both structured data, as Kariti was explaining before, but also not unstructured data that came from different sources like virtual infrastructure, virtual and physical networks, probes, or, or whatever, and correlating these with the federated network inventory type of data. Uh, the AI, in the end, as it used uh, uh, initially to generate uh, intelligent event, as we have seen from the poll, uh, predictive event is one uh, relevant type uh, to be considered here, and this event can uh, augment, for instance, uh, the human capability in the proactive maintenance uh, area domain, or they can trigger, for instance, uh, infrastructure refilling task uh, as part of an, an intelligent capacity planning uh, process uh, itself. But what we foresee is that only when these three elements will finally converge that the full benefit of the intelligent operation uh, can be unleashed. Uh, it's important to know that this transformation is by no means linear, so there is no definitive starting point, uh, uh, whether it is automation or analytics or uh, AI. Uh, what we found in our experience that is really relevant uh, is to have uh, a structured discovery process uh, to identify the value streams uh, and uh, uh, that give place to initiative and allocate uh, properly budget uh, to this initiative and monitoring carefully the ROI of each single, uh, each one of these initiatives and progressing in parallel to transform or to train the workforce in order to maximize the benefit. As we speak, uh, and uh, also as we've seen from the poll, there are very few companies that are leading the way in this uh, transformation. And these companies are taking an holistic approach, addressing uh, simultaneously three key dimensions. That are the process reinvention, basically the data and the, the workforce dimension uh, itself, together with the tools. Uh, this company, these leaders uh, are a real minority. As we, uh, as we saw in, our, uh, in the same research that I mentioned before, uh, uh, less than 10% of the early adopters are uh, uh, progressing simultaneously across all dimensions. The, the vast majority of the companies that we interviewed are mainly targeting, as we speak, uh, process efficiency through task automation, and they are not addressing uh, the human workforce dimension and also the process uh, reinvention uh, that comes with the AI. Uh, as an example of journey, we have been working uh, uh, quite ex extensively with a telco operator that started recently its intelligence operation journey. Uh, after the initial discovery phase, uh, they focused uh, their attention on uh, a, a limited set of uh, incidents uh, in the network operation space that took about 30% of the overall effort uh, at first level of operation. The uh, structural data analysis uh, and uh, uh, process analysis brought to automate a very complicated, the more than 200 steps uh, process uh, itself. This has provided immediate benefit that impact the bottom line without any major disruption itself. During the same phase, uh, uh, also value stream or use cases have been identified where uh, machine learning is a technical enabler. And uh, this uh, uh, leveraging uh, the data collection and correlation that has been developed uh, previously, uh, the machine learning uh, uh, and all the data that has been uh, collected, uh, the machine learning algorithm can predict incident on a specific access network uh, domain on the basis of uh, alarms, logs uh, from network equipment for probes and travel, travel ticket uh, itself. This ability, this after the training process of this uh, uh, 
uh, machine learning future incident type of generator, we reached a very promising results in terms of uh, uh, incident with 100% score are real uh, false, while anything in the middle uh, between zero and 100 uh, required human intervention to understand if uh, a real ticket needs to be generated. This kind of transformation, this kind of new processes are uh, disruptive by their nature and require new skills in the workforce and as such they have not been deployed to scale. But it's very interesting uh, to know that we are getting there and we are uh, very, the, the, the real dimension that needs to be addressed is the process and the skills dimension itself. A uh, few commonality from uh, uh, the, the different cases that we have uh, seen uh, so far from the leaders in this space. Uh, there is no solve all solution from a technology standpoint. Uh, a mix or a constellation of technology that can create uh, an highly adaptable solution uh, is what they are uh, uh, leveraging today. An holistic discovery approach is another key ingredient, uh, analyzing the existing processes, tasks, skills, and data in order to identify the use cases, as I said before, and the benefit uh, introduced. And these are the basis to rethink their process, uh, to rethink their skill, uh, and also design the workforce transformation plan. Uh, then, uh, in the end, uh, just to uh, uh, conclude, uh, an open and interactive uh, appro uh, innovation, innovative approach uh, is what is required in order to get fully to the human-machine alliance that we all foresee. Then, what is needed to create the workforce of the future? That is one of the key uh, questions that we are always asked. Uh, interesting enough, uh, what the executives uh, perceive is quite different from what the workforce uh, perceive themselves. From the same Accenture uh, research that we um, performed, it clearly emerged that most executives uh, underestimate the willingness of their workforce to acquire relevant skills in this field. 25% of the executive uh, perceive uh, resistance by the, the workforce as a key obstacle in adoption to scale of this kind of uh, intelligent operation platform. But what about the workers? The same, uh, uh, the, the majority of the workers that we interviewed are positive about intelligent operation, and more than 70% consider it is important to develop their own skills. So they are impatient to embrace, embrace the AI. Uh, what is remarkable in the end uh, as, a, as, a, as a final result uh, is that uh, less than 10% of the executive are uh, uh, planning uh, during the next three year period uh, to reskill their workforce. And this is one of the key challenge or issues that need to be uh, addressed collectively. But what is the approach in order to be ready for the intelligent operation? We basically see three steps as for this, this slide. The step one is to reimagine the work completely, moving the spotlight from the jobs to the nature of work itself. This means that what needs to be assessed today is not the type of job that is performed on a daily basis, but the tasks and the skills that are available today need to be uh, assessed. And then assessing also the range of team and technology, it can be identified what tasks can be allocated to people, what tasks can be allocated to the machine, whether it is automation based or whether it is AI, Powered. This means creating uh, new roles as uh, the automation uh, enable to take on uh, value, higher value work. This role need to be, this new role will uh, evolve uh, basically from operational role to insight driven, from monoskill type of role to multi-skill and from generalist roles like we have today to more and more specialized. Uh, just an example of what we see or we foresee that is happening uh, in the industry of new roles that are being created, uh, let me think about very quickly three type of roles uh, that we, we see, oh, type of role, like the trainers, the explainer, and the sustainer. Uh, the trainers that we will see more and more in the intelligent operation are what is happening today in the early trial, on the early deployment, uh, 
the human trainer helps to improve the algorithm performance through activity like the data cleansing, the data labeling, whether it is an unsupervised or supervised type of learning. As for the previous example on the incident management, the trainers help the model to correlate the weak signal like non-critical alarms uh, with the relevant information that comes from the logger in order to predict the incident and train the model accordingly. The explainer that may seem quite an odd role in the very beginning, uh, but again, uh, when intelligent operations start to be deployed at scales, uh, the concern that is created by the black box nature of some uh, automation and machine learning algorithm need to be addressed. Uh, when the suggested action by a machine learning algorithm somehow defy the conventional wisdom. This role uh, are really required, or will be really required in the, in the next future to explain to the operation staff uh, the inner worker, the working of this algorithm or automation in order to create the proper level of confidence, uh, confidence in this solution uh, in the operator themselves that will uh, work side by side uh, uh, with this machine on a daily basis. And then another key role uh, needed when the solution will be deployed to scale is the sustainer, what we call as a sustainer. That uh, it operates, uh, uh, this sustainer makes sure that the intelligent operation platform operates as it is being designed to. So if any unintended consequence occur, they ensure that immediate action are taken accordingly and the model is fine-tuned according to the new dynamic condition itself. Uh, the step two of this transformation is pivoting properly the workforce. That means setting up the proper business case that does not simply bank efficiency to benefit the bottom line, but reuse part of the saving in investment for the future workforce means organizing for agility, because as people do less repetitive work and they participate in a series of project team, they must be given more autonomy and decision-making power. The operation organization needs to be able to assemble and disassemble around project teams and people need to be freed up from functional constraints. Then a new leadership DNA is required, because as teams assemble and disassemble, the leader becomes themselves uh, co-creator and collaborator working on a daily basis with their people and the decision-making process uh, needs to be pushed closer to where the actual works uh, occur. Then when also this pivotal activity has been performed, then the new model can be scaled up uh, to the whole operation uh, organization. This required a dedicated and agile uh, transformation office uh, to consistently keep track of all the initiatives that will happen in parallel in each of the areas to bring the intelligent operation to life and measure constantly the benefit along the way in order to confirm or the cancel the initiative that were, they are ongoing because again, it will be an iterative approach with failure along the way. This new solution that will be deployed, developed along the way will enrich the framework, the innovation framework, the constellation of technology that make up the final uh, solution. And then finally, digital training and learning opportunity need to be given to scales uh, to the full, to all the workforce uh, in order to get uh, access to the most appropriate no knowledge required to work with the intelligent operation platform itself. Thank you, and over to you, James. Thank you very much. Uh, Aurelia, that's fantastic. That takes us to our third and final audience question poll. How do you expect AI will primarily affect the workforce in your organization in the next five years? Or you can choose to answer this more broadly. Do you think that existing workers will need to change their skill sets? Is that the main impact? Do you think that your organization's productivity will improve? Do you think that workers' current skill sets will be augmented? Or do you think that they'll be replaced, that your organization's workforce will be reduced? So obviously all of these factors are uh, somewhat overlapping and interrelated, but, but pick one. What do you think will be the, the main impact that we'll see from AI in the, uh, the workforce, uh, either your own organization or more broadly in the, the telecom industry over the next five years? 
And whilst you're thinking about your answer to that, just remind everybody that we're getting very close to the Q&A session where you can submit your questions via that Q&A widget to Kaviti and Aurelio. OK, let's see what people have voted for. OK, so we, we do have a clear winner here. And in fact, a nice um, progression downwards. So um, a, chain, a need, need to change skill sets is, is, is the clear winner. Um, productivity increasing, um, skill sets being augmented, uh, and um, uh, an optimistic audience, uh, only 11% of which think that the workforce will be reduced, or that the main impact will be that the workforce will be reduced. So clearly there's a there's a, an item on everybody's personal agenda to increase their, their knowledge and their, their technical skills surrounding the topic of, of AI. Um, and they see it generally as a, as a positive for their organization in that it will increase productivity. Okay, that's uh, encouraging. Um, let's move on to the conclusion. So very briefly to wrap up, we talked about some of the key drivers behind next generation networks. We talked about it being to do with economics. You've got to tackle the biggest cost in networking, and of course, that is operations. It's all about efficiency. You want to be able to spin up resources as and when you need. You don't want idle capacity sitting around simply depreciating. It's also about agility. You need to be able to bring up new services quickly, and to do that, you need to be able to predict events, anticipate demand, and adapt to ever-changing conditions. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's also about security. Uh, you need to quickly diagnose, isolate, and mitigate all of these various cyber threats in order to keep one step ahead of the bad guys. And we need to be able to do all of these things with, with no or minimal human intervention so that your operations can scale cost effectively to meet the growing demand on the network. With that, that brings us to the audience Q&A session. So if you haven't done so already, please submit your question via the Q&A widget. And uh, Aurelio and Kiriti will be delighted to, uh, to answer. Um, I'll go to the question list and, and, and start with this one. Uh, what are the requirements for the network engineer to succeed in the era of self-driving network? Well, as it's a, a Juniper concept, we'll give you first crack at that, Kariti. What, what do you think the network engineer needs? What are his, his or her key requirements? Thank you, James. Um, it's, uh, I think it's really interesting that when we looked at what people are seeing in terms of how this will affect them, a lot of them said changing skill sets. But I think the real requirement here is to um, enhance skill sets, to augment skill sets. So this question goes directly to that. I'm a network engineer. I know BGP. I know how to do BGP policies. I know how to work with a Juniper device or a Cisco device or a Nokia device. Do I throw that all away and do I learn something new? And I think the answer is you still need all that, but you also need to do some scripting to improve your automation. You also need to uh, learn how the machine, machine learning uh, works, not the details, but how can I tweak it and how can I make it do what I, what I need it to do. So if you had a self-driving network that set BGP policies automatically for you, and then you realize that the BGP policy is not optimal or maybe just outright wrong, and you go and fix the policy, it'll just happen again and the machine uh, learning will just keep overriding what you did. What you need to go uh, is to the machine learning algorithm and say, I'm going to tweak it this way so that uh, the policy comes out right. So the answer is that you actually have to keep your skills and keep them sharp, but um, all the skills that you already have, but you have to then enhance them with n more knowledge of scripting, more knowledge of uh, machine learning, more knowledge of um, how to debug these machine learning algorithms, which are not, which is not easy. So on the other side of it is that you have to make sure that whoever's doing the machine learning algorithm gives you 
the insight into why it's doing what it's doing, uh, a, a level of transparency and a level of debuggability so that you can do what you need to do. But I think life gets really exciting. <laughs> and Aurelia, you talked let about the pivot of the workforce, yeah, didn't you, in your presentation? Yep. Let me just add on top of what Kariti said, that is made a very great point into this respect, that the other element here is moving from a, a functional type of work where you are 100% of your time, the BGP engineer that Kariti was mentioning, to an agile type of working where you work in project team that are assembled and then disassembled in a, in a quicker way around initiatives that are very clear and limited in time itself. And so being able to work in a collaborative way into this new approach, uh, leveraging also the, the machine learning uh, and the automation type of stuff with all the skills that required is another big change uh, to complement uh, the new skill set, the network, the, the network engineer, but also the network uh, operational guy, operation guys of the future need to have. Okay, great. Uh, let's take this next question from our audience. Uh, this one's about, I guess, the regulatory, regulatory implications or the legal implications of using AI uh, and data analytics. Um, I'm slightly rewording the question here, but are, are there some um, legal, diff obviously there's different laws in different uh, countries. Um, uh, are there any legal considerations that uh, we need to, to bear in mind when using AI and, and data analytics on the, on the network. Um, I guess um, anonymizing the data is one thing, but um, perhaps Aurelio, you or Kiriti have got some thoughts on that. Aurelio, you want to go? Yeah, yeah, okay. So this is quite a a relevant topic, uh, both on the data itself uh, and uh, on the regulatory itself. It very depends on whether it is the continent, US, or uh, Europe that have very different approach into this, uh, into this respect. Uh, when we nail down, in any case, uh, what would be required for the intelligent operation, uh, uh, likely enough, uh, uh, we are not on the front office, but we are more on the back office type of uh, Requirement also in terms of data gathering uh, itself. So the type of information that are uh, required, the type of data that are required, the usage, the performance, the logs itself uh, are, uh, even if they are relevant and need to be leveraged in, each, in every single country, they are quote unquote less sensitive to what are the, the constraints itself uh, and uh, they need to be used uh, not for uh, acting directly on the customer, but to improve the level of like, availability and flexibility and activity of the network uh, itself. So it will go hand in hand uh, with all the customer data privacy uh, regulation topic, uh, but in any case uh, uh, will be, I mean, uh, a little bit easier to manage uh, as we are uh, foreseen in this uh, early implementation uh, uh, around the globe of automation and the AI applied to the operation itself. I, I completely agree, but I want to also bring in another aspect um, that we don't realize that when we talk about autonomy and autono autonomic uh, you know, working, like autonomic networks, that there's a transfer of autonomy from the humans to the machine that's doing this. And so is there correspondingly a transfer of responsibility? Is there correspondingly a transfer of transparency? And I think that's something that we also need to be very careful about, that yes, I gave the system more autonomy, do I still retain enough control that if the system were to do something um, potentially really bad uh, or just maybe suboptimal, I have a way to to fix it. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna push out onto everybody's screens a survey. 
Uh, this might pop up in a new tab on your browser. It's just to collect feedback, what you liked, didn't like about the webinar, sort of things you might like us to cover in the future. Uh, so whilst you're, you're uh, completing that, I'm going to go back and ask a couple more questions. And the next one is about the standard development organizations and what work they're doing in this area of applying um, artificial intelligence to networking. Um, the question is about, you know, are they are they moving at the right speed uh, to to make all of this a, a reality for for service providers and network operators? Um, just wondered if you had any any thoughts about the um, work that's going on. Uh, I suppose we could broaden the question not just to the standard development organisations, but also perhaps to some of the open source initiatives that are out there uh, to do with AI in the in the field of networking. Is that something that um, UQET or Aurelio um, have uh, have had a chance to, to to look at. Sure, yeah, I can jump in on this. Thanks, James. Um, the standards um, organizations, the standard, uh, the, what we call SDOs, um, generally tend to be slow moving. Um, it's a good thing you brought up the open source as well. So you have uh, two sort of approaches to this. You have the standards organizations like the ITF, the ITU. 3GPP and so on. And they are moving in this direction, but somewhat slowly. And then you have the open config, which is sort of a loose, uh, it's not a standards development as such, but there's a lot of open source going on there. And they are actually moving a little bit faster. But at the end of the day, I think uh, this is an area where we need to innovate without constraint in some sense uh, and I don't want to you know sound negative about standards organizations and open source uh, but we need to be able to try new ideas at a very high pace some will succeed some will fail I can tell you as part of the Contrail team we had to rethink what telemetry and analytics means in Contrail uh, we completely re-implemented it three times so that it is at the high quality, you know, the high rate that we need without overwhelming all the systems. And so I think it's 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 an area where we have to play this balance game between sort of individuals and individual companies innovating fast and then things coming together and becoming standards or maybe open source. Uh, and that balance where if you bring the standards in too soon and try to, you know, if we are at a point where, you know, innovation has reached somewhere good, um, maybe that's the time. But, you know, we shouldn't pull the trigger too soon and say, okay, now everyone has to conform to this particular way of doing things. So I think that's a careful balance that we should, the, the entire industry should be aware of. Okay, and that Aurelia, did you did you want to chime in on that one too? Yeah, no, absolutely. That's perfect, right point from uh, Cariti. What we see in addition on on the market today that again, uh, as I said before, one solution that does not exist, uh, but a constellation of technologies, what is required, and open source uh, will play uh, a key role uh, as well. Uh, what we see in terms of, uh, uh, again, uh, the, the, the first step uh, in uh, leveraging, uh, collecting the data in one single location uh, internally with the internal data lake as the initial approach uh, from many operators, uh, having relying also on uh, some sort of smart agent technology for pre-filtering uh, the alarms like for the app for mix uh, technology are one set of solutions that are uh, we see in some uh, operator where data are aggregated and then uh, the use case is built on top uh, and able to understand if they are the right, right data, right level of granularity, right, uh, right level of uh, depth of the history of this data itself. And on top of this, uh, we see uh, also open source, like can be the Spark uh, ML type of library, for instance, or many other uh, machine learning type of uh, uh, open source library available on the market uh, uh, itself. Uh, also, the uh, hybrid cloud can come handy into this case, uh, uh, leveraging uh, the, 
the, the, the public cloud provider in order to process this vast amount uh, of data in order even to provide a real-time uh, type of insight uh, into the data itself. And this type of mix of the internal and the public uh, cloud uh, is an interesting uh, and very uh, innovative topic that we see in some uh, uh, operator uh, in order, again, uh, to be quick, uh, agile, and flexible uh, in uh, finding the right solution uh, and adapting along the way as more knowledge is gained uh, on, uh, on the data and on the new processes that need to be applied. Great. Well, thank you, Aurelio Nocciarino from Accenture and Kirisi Compella from Juniper Networks for sharing your insights on this topic today. We do have some more questions, but I'll, I'll ask you to, to follow up via email with, with our audience. Um, it just remains for me to, to thank our presenters and, of course, our audience for taking part today. Uh, I hope you found it valuable and look forward to seeing you at the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, James. Thank you.